Hello everyone, it's Benny, and in this video, we're going to begin our discussion of anti-aliasing. Now, when most people think of anti-aliasing, they think about edge anti-aliasing, where you do things to smooth out polygon edges, and that is a form of anti-aliasing. However, most aliasing artifacts actually show up in textures. So, before we do the discussion of edge anti-aliasing, that's going to come in either the next video or the video after, we're going to be talking about dealing with aliasing artifacts in textures. And the way you do that is with texture filtering. Now, in my 3D Engine example, we already applied a basic form of texture filtering that's pretty much used by default in just about anything nowadays, and that's linear filtering. And if I build and run that this, you notice this is what well, this is what textures look like with linear filtering on. They look very nice and smooth as long as you're close to them. As soon as you start backing off, and you'll probably notice this on the cube first, yeah, things start breaking down. Not sure how well the video is picking this up, but yeah, now you're starting to see the plane breaking down, just getting all pixelated and shimmery, and it doesn't look very good. So we're going to talk about dealing with that, because y you don't want to have thing textures in the distance just looking terrible. So that's what we're going to be talking about in this video. So to overcome texture aliasing, you first have to understand how and why it occurs. Now, this is the gray brick texture that I had on the floor plane in the example I just showed you. It's 512 by 512, and this is what the texture looks like just normally, as a texture. Now, the reason you need filtering at all is because you basically never draw the texture like this. There's almost never a situation where you happen to be drawing a plane that takes up exactly 512 by 512 pixels and is facing directly at the camera. <laughs> so, yeah. The way you overcome this, the way you draw the texture at different resolutions, you know, different sizes and different angles, is with filtering. Use some form of filter to basically approximate this texture at, again, different resolutions, sizes, and angles. So to sort of demonstrate that, I've cut out two pieces of the texture. The first is a 16 by 16 pixel part of the texture, right, and then this is what it looks like right there. Again, not sure how well this is going to show up in the video, but you know, there it is. And that's what that looks like. And I've also isolated a slightly larger part of the texture. This is the 128 by 128 part of the texture. And the challenge in both cases is the same. We have a 32 by 32 pixel plane that is looking directly at the camera, and for whatever reason, these sections of the texture are what's on there. So we're going to be drawing two of these planes, one with the 16 by 16 part on the plane, and the other with this 128 by 128 part approximated on this 32 by 32 plane. Again, this is still a little bit more ideal than you're going to encounter in a real-world situation, but it'll do, for example. Now, the most basic form of sampling, or filtering you can do, is nearest filtering. And this is the, sort of the old way it's done. It's done in all the really ancient 3D games. And the way it works is pretty simple. Just find whatever point, you know, is in the texture, whatever po the point in the texture you're interested in, and just select whatever pixel is closest to that. Now for the 16 6 by 16 pixel thing, that would look like this on a 32 by 32 plane with nearest filtering. Yeah, and I've blown it up a little bit so that the pix so that the individual colors of pixels is a bit more obvious, but yeah, it's not exactly pretty. It's very heavily pixelated and, well, yeah, it doesn't look very nice. Now, on the other hand, our 128 by 128 te texture sample, or texture area that we're mapping onto the 32 by 32 plane, looks a little something like this with nearest filtering. Again, it looks a little better because, you know, it can actually get pixels for all 
well, you know, all the pixels have their own unique color. It's not reusing pixels like in the, the you know, the upsampled one. So dance sampling work or down sampling looks a little bit better, but it's still not great. It's still clearly very aliased, and if you were to back off a few feet, yeah, it does start to look a little like the original textures, but they're not a great representation of them. So, nearest filtering, it works, and it's cheap, but it's not very great. And that's why people have moved to what's basically universal nowadays, and that's linear filtering. Now, the way linear filtering works, I've actually already talked about during the shadow mapping videos I did earlier, but just as a quick description, the way linear filtering works is rather than just sampling the closest pixel to whatever point you're interested in the texture, it actually samples the nearest four pixels. And it'll average them, and it'll be a weighted average, so the pixels that are closer to the point you're interested in get more weight in the average than pixels that are farther away. And when you do that for this 16 by 16 thing, we're upsampling to 32 by 32, it looks like this. And that's a lot nicer. It looks really nice, really smooth, there's no odd artifacts, and if you take a few, few steps back, it really does start looking like the original part. And this is sort of the effect we get when we're close to the textures. This is why things look nice when we're near the planes. When we back off from the plane, however, something different happens. You get sort of what happens with this 128 by 128 texture when we downsample it to 32 by 32. Well, it looks something like this. It's an improvement, but not by much. <laughs> you know, it's a little smoother, it's smoothed out a few edges, but there's still really obvious pixels are just standing out just, you know, popping out of the image. The lines look really sharp and jagged, and if you back off a few steps, again, it does start looking more like the original texture than with nearest filtering, say, but it's not great. And this is the sort of artifact we've been running into. So now, now that I've talked about how all this works, basically, and the artifact that shows up, Let's talk about why this artifact shows up. Why this doesn't look particularly great. So, just so I don't confuse you, I'm going to be referring to pixels in the texture as texels. Okay? And I'm going to be referring to pixels in the final image as still just pixels. Okay? So, pixels from the texture, texels. <laughs> Alright. And with that, we can discuss the issue with linear filtering. And the issue with linear filtering is basically a distance problem. And let me explain what I mean by that. What we're doing is we have this 128 by 128 area of text of texture, and we're downsampling that into a 32 by 32 area. And so with that, there's four texels distance between each pixel in the final image. All right? <laughs> Is that making sense? So there's four pixels in the texture distance between each pixel in the final image. Four texels between each pixel. Okay. <laughs> Hope that doesn't confuse you. And the reason that's a problem is because linear filtering isn't taking into account the fact that there's a four texel distance between each pixel. All linear filtering do is doing is it's looking at where that point is in the texture, sampling the four nearest texels, and just returning that. And, well, that doesn't take into account the whole four texel distance between, well, each pixel in, in this case, because there's actually be a four by four area of texels between each pixel. And ideally, you'd want to take into account that whole four by four area, and, well, use that but that's not what linear filtering does. It just, again, it takes into account a 2x2 two two area, just the 2x2 two two area of the nearest texels, and uses that. So basically, you have this whole area of texels that are just being completely ignored by your filtering. They're not being taken into account. Their influence just doesn't matter in that case. So, yeah, that's a problem. 
And interestingly enough, because of this, as you start downsampling larger and larger te textures into smaller and smaller areas, linear filtering actually degrades into the exact same quality as nearest filtering. Because again, the whole problem with nearest filtering is that it ignores the influence of all the other texture texels, and that's exactly what's happening with linear filtering in this case. So, how do we overcome this? Of course, the easy answer is just, oh, we're going to use a better form of filtering. The problem is, the most advanced filtering your graphics card supports is linear filtering. So, well, that's a problem. But, there's a bit of a trick we can do. Here's the thing. What if I took my texture and downsampled it to half the size? Now, in the half size texture, there's, of course, going to be two texels but for each pixel in this case. But here's the thing. Linear filtering takes into account a 2x2 two two texel area. So if I use linear filtering for the downsampling, since, again, I only need 2x2 two two texel area, it works perfectly. It does exactly what I want it to. Okay? So if I downsample the texture by half, then everything's done properly, okay? So, but what happens if I take this half-size texture and downsample it again, downsample it again to half the size of the half-size texture? So now, it's a quarter the size of the original texture. Well, again, I only need a 2x2 two two texel area, so, and again, linear filtering does that, so, yeah, that gives me a good representation of the half-size texture. But here's the thing. The, each texel in the half-size texture, that's giving a proper representation of a 2x2 two two texel area in the original texture. Okay? So each pixel in the half-size texture is representative of, two by, of a 2x2 two two area in the original texture. So when I downsample that again, for, linear filtering is sampling a 2x2 two two area in this half-size texture. Okay? But each pixel in that 2x2 two two area represents a 2x2 two two area in the original texture. So, effectively, I'm sampling a 4x4 four four area from the original texture when I'm downsampling the half-size texture to half-size again. Okay? I know that can be a, a little bit tricky to understand at first, because it's an average of averages, but hopefully that makes some sense. So, I now have a quarter-size texture, which gives a proper downsampled representation of the original texture. So, that's the trick. As long as I keep downsampling the texture in half, I get a proper representation, a proper downsampled representation of the original texture. So I can keep doing that. I'm going to cut the quarter size texture in half again. And whoops, that's the wrong thing I want to scroll off on. And then I can take the eighth size texture, downsample again, take the sixteenth size texture, cut it in half again, and so forth and so on. Just keep doing that until the final texture is only one pixel in size. And this is the idea of MIP mapping. Just progressively downsampling the texture to half the size, because linear filtering can do that properly, until you have a one by one pixel. So now, cool, I have the representation of the texture, or, well yeah, the original texture at a whole bunch of different resolutions, and it's all, they're all proper representations of it. So what? How can I use that to improve the quality of, well, the textures when I'm rendering? Well, what you can do is, rather than always sampling from this big, full-size, original texture, is you can select one of the bit maps. So if you're in a case where, for instance, you're downsampling the texture to less than half its original size, well, that's a case where linear filtering wouldn't work properly anymore. So instead, you downsample from the half-sized mip map, for instance. 
and that way linear filtering still maps to pixels properly and you're never you know mismatching pixels like that and it's just a really nice and elegant way to overcome the problem so if you're using mip mapping if you're selecting the mip mapping that's most appropriate for whatever pixel area you're rendering to for our upsampling it looks exactly the same it's still linear filtering at the end of the day, and you can't make a higher resolution texture unless you actually create it yourself. So, yeah. It still gives you the nice smoothness that linear filtering does when the texture is close to the camera. But, when you're downsampling, when you're looking at something that's farther away from the camera, well, again, remember, before our linear filtering wasn't properly accounting for all the pixels. When we use MIP mapping, however, we can. We can sample from... I haven't actually done the math by hand, but if I had to eyeball it, I would guess it would be from this tech, tech one, but I'm honestly not sure. <laughs> and, well, you notice it looks a lot nicer. And when you do start backing off, this really does start looking a lot like the original texture. It converges very nicely to it. It's still not absolutely perfect, but it's a really, really good approximation of it. So yeah, that's the idea of MIP mapping. It can vastly improve this, you know, the texture qualities. It, you can prevent you from ever having something that just degrades into that speckly, aliased, nearest filtering. And yeah, so that's how MIP mapping works. So, that'll wrap things up for this video. And in the next video, we're going to talk about a practical implementation of MIP mapping with OpenGL. We're going to take a 3D game engine that renders with OpenGL, and we're going to implement MIP mapping in that. And we're going to discuss some of the issues with MIP mapping, because it's not a silver bullet. And we're going to talk about some of the tricks you can do to use MIP mapping more intelligently, to get the absolute best texture quality. And that'll include things like anisotropic filtering and trilinear filtering and all that stuff. So, thank you. Hope you enjoyed. Hope you learned. And I'll see you then.